Hey guys. So I'm filming in kind of a weird position right now because this is the only position I can comfortably sit in where I'm not like laying down. Um, <laughs> my stomach has gotten much bigger, obviously, and it's kind of hard to sit and breathe normally. So, but everything's going good. It's just um, I've officially hit the uncomfortable phase of pregnancy and I have just under two months left until my due date. So I don't know how I'm going to get any bigger. <laughs> so today's video is a request from Jason Open Mind and Ingram. Thank you for the request. Um, it's actually about the Yorkshire Ripper, which I did not know a lot about. Um, I'd heard of him, but I had never studied the case. And it's pretty crazy how many uh, attacks and kills he has on his resume, I guess you could call it. So you are definitely in for a ride today if you have not heard of this case. A lot of the information is going to be basically um, hitting on each victim, um, surviving, and the ones that sadly did not survive, and what happened to them, um, because there are so many. So Peter William Sutcliffe, who was known as the Yorkshire Ripper, is an English serial killer who was convicted on the 22nd of May in 1981 of murdering 13 women and attempting to murder seven. He is serving 20 concurrent life sentences, which were originally life imprisonment, but were increased to whole life orders in 2010. All except for two of his murders took place in West Yorkshire. The others were in Manchester. Now, a quick background on Sutcliffe. He was born in Bingley in the West Riding of Yorkshire to a working class family. He was reportedly a loner in school and he left school at age 15 and worked a series of odd jobs, including two stints as a grave digger in the 1960s. Between 1971 and 1973, he worked in a factory for a television company on a packaging line. He left his position there when he was asked to go on the road as a salesman. Now working uh, another job or two, I believe, after that, he was actually fired from a job for the theft of used tires. Now, by some reports, Sutcliffe did use uh, prostitutes as a young man. Um, I don't, that sounds really harsh to say used prostitutes, but he paid for prostitutes, and it has actually been speculated that he was burned by one who conned him out of money, and that is a little important later. Sutcliffe met Sonia Sherma, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that last name wrong, on the 14th of February in 1967, and they married on the 10th of August in 1974. She suffered several miscarriages, and they were informed she would not be able to have children. Now, during their marriage, she did have an affair with an ice cream van driver. I'm not sure when Sutcliffe became aware of this affair, if he did ever prior to his imprisonment, but they stayed together, so I assume he didn't know about it. And in 1977, um, using her teaching income, they bought a home together. And this is the home that they lived in um, during the time of Sutcliffe's arrest. Now, through his childhood and adolescence, oddly enough, Sutcliffe showed no signs of abnormality. Now, later down the road, because of his jobs as a grave digger, he claims, he developed an unhealthy, macabre sense of humor. Um, he sort of became desensitized to death. And apparently in his late adolescence, he developed a growing obsession with voyeurism and spent a lot of his time spying on prostitutes and the men who sought out their services. Now, Sutcliffe's um, attacks and murder sprees began in 1969. He first assaulted a prostitute that he had met while searching for the prostitute who conned him out of money. He was apparently in his friend Trevor Birdsall's van with Trevor, um, left the van, and walked up St. Paul's Road in Bradford until he was out of sight um, to Trevor. When he returned, he had been running and was very out of breath. He then told Trevor to drive off very quickly and said that he had followed a prostitute into a garage and hit her over the head with a stone in a sock. Um, it's unclear whether he told this to Trevor right away. I get the feeling he didn't necessarily tell him exactly what happened, but this is what he told police. And according to his statement to the police, he said, quote, 
I got out of the car, went across the road and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock and whatever was in it came out. I went back to the car and got in it. Now police visited his home the next day as the woman that he had attacked noted Trevor's uh, license plate and Sutcliffe admitted that he did hit her, but he claimed it was with his hand and not a weapon. The police told him that he was very lucky that the woman did not want anything to do more with the case um, as she was a known prostitute and didn't want to deal with the police basically. The next attack happened six years later in 1975, um, on July 5th to be exact. This happened in Keeley where he attacked Anna Rogolsky who was out walking alone and he struck her unconscious with a hammer and slashed her stomach with a knife. Now, a neighbor overheard this um, and came to see what happened. Therefore, Sutcliffe fled the scene and left without killing her. Rogolsky survived after extensive medical intervention, but was understandably psychologically traumatized by the event. Sutcliffe next attacked an olive smelt in Halifax during August. He struck her from behind, um, as he did with the previous attacks, and used a knife to slash her, this time above her buttocks. Again, he was interrupted and left his victim badly injured, but alive. Like Rogalski, Smelt suffered major emotional and mental health problems due to this event. On August 27th of that year, Sutcliffe attacked a 14-year-old girl by the name of Tracy Brown in Silsden. He struck her from behind and hit her on the head five times while she was walking along a country lane. He ran off when he saw the lights of a passing car, leaving his victim requiring brain surgery. He was not convicted of this particular attack. Um, however, he did confess to it in 1992. Now, the first victim to lose her life to Sutcliffe was Wilma McCann on October 30th. She was from Leeds and she was a mother of four. Sutcliffe struck her twice with a hammer before stabbing her 15 times in the neck, chest, and abdomen. Um, at this point, an investigation, an extensive investigation began um, to find the killer, which involved 150 police officers and 11,000 interviews, but this investigation failed to find the culprit. One of McCann's daughters uh, sadly died by suicide in December of 2007, reportedly after suffering for many years of depression over her mother's death. Um, in the following year of 1976, we have more attacks, of course. Um, the first one being in January, when he stabbed 42-year-old Emily Jackson 52 times. Jackson, who was in a bad state financially, had been using the family van to exchange sexual favors for money. He picked her up while she was soliciting outside of a pub, and he drove about a half a mile to some abandoned buildings. He hit her in the head with a hammer and then dragged her body into a yard that was just full of rubbish and used a sharpened screwdriver to stab her in the neck, chest, and abdomen. He stomped on her thigh, which left in, uh, behind an imprint of his boot. In May of 1976, Sutcliffe attacked a 20-year-old by the name of Marcella Claxton in Leeds. She was walking home from a party and he offered her a ride home, which she accepted. Um, she asked if he could pull the car over so that she could use the restroom. And as she was doing so, he hit her from behind with a hammer. She was actually left alive and testified at his trial. Tragically, at the time of this attack, she had been four months pregnant and suffered a miscarriage due to the ordeal. Um, we now go on to the next year in 1977. Uh, the first attack being February the 5th. He attacked an Irene Richardson, who was a Chapel Town sex worker. Richardson was bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Once she was dead, he mutilated her corpse with a knife. Um, two months later, we see the next attack on April 23rd. He killed Patricia Tina Atkinson, who was a sex worker from Bradford, in her apartment where police found a boot print on the bed sheets. Two months later, on the 26th of June, he murdered 16-year-old Jane McDonald in Chapel Town. She was not a sex worker, and in the public perception, this showed that all women were potential victims of the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe uh, seriously assaulted a Maureen Long in July. He was interrupted and left her for dead. On the 1st of October of 77, Sutcliffe murdered Jean Jordan, who was a sex worker in Manchester. In a confession, he said that he had realized the $5 note that he gave her could be traceable. 
and after hosting a family party in his new home that him and his wife had just bought, he returned to the wasteland behind um, Manchester Southern Cemetery, where he had left the body, to retrieve the note. He was unable to find the $5 note, so he mutilated Jordan's corpse and moved it. Now, on October 9th, Jordan's body was found by a local dairy worker and future actor, Bruce Jones. The $5 note, um, which was hidden in a secret compartment in Jordan's handbag, was found and traced to certain branches of a bank. Police went to great lengths to try and find out what employers would have given out this note, but after long research, they were unable to do so. On December 14th of 1977, Sutcliffe attacked a Marilyn Moore, who was another sex worker from Leeds. She survived and provided police with a description of her attacker, and tire tracks that were found at that scene matched one left at a previous scene. In 1978, police continued to search um, for any tracing of the $5 note and who it could have been given to um, through different employers. And through this, they interviewed many workers about the murders, including Sutcliffe. He was interviewed, but he wasn't further investigated. And he had been contacted and disregarded as the Ripper on many different occasions. That same month, he killed again. His victim was an Yvonne Pearson, who was a 21-year-old. And she was a prostitute from Bradford. He bludgeoned her over the head with a hammer, then jumped on her chest before stuffing horsehair into her mouth from a discarded sofa under which he hid her body. Her body was not found until March the 26th. 10 days later, he killed a Helen Ritka, who was an 18 year old sex worker. He struck her over the head five times as she exited his vehicle before stripping most of the clothes from her body and then stabbing her repeatedly in the chest. Her body was found three days later beneath railway arches on the timber yard to which he had driven her. On May 16th, Sutcliffe killed Vera Millward in an attack in the car park of Manchester Royal Infirmary. We now skip ahead to 1979. On April 4th, he killed a Josephine Whitaker, who was a 19-year-old building society clerk, whom he attacked as she was walking home. Now, despite forensic evidence, police were diverted um, through the investigation for months because of a tape that they received that turned out to be a complete hoax. The tape was a recording that claimed to be from the murderer who was taunting the assistant chief that was leading the investigation. The tape contained a man's voice saying, I'm Jack, I see you're having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you're no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Based on the recorded message, police began searching for a man with a weird side accent. The hoaxer also sent two letters to the police and the Daily Mirror in March of 1978, boasting of his crimes. The letters were signed Jack the Ripper and claimed responsibility for the murder of a 26-year-old Joan Harrison, who was not a victim of Sutcliffe, who had been killed in November of 1975. At the time, police mistakenly thought that Harrison's death was not public knowledge, which led them obviously to believe that this uh, recording was true for a while. Um, Later down the road in 2005, DNA evidence on um, the envelopes from the tapes and letters was tested and proven to be that of a John Samuel Humble, who was an unemployed alcoholic and long-term resident of the Ford estate in Sunderland. And he was charged <clears throat> with attempting to pervert the course of justice for sending the hoax letters and the tape. On September 1st of this year, uh, Sutcliffe murdered again, uh, this time a 20-year-old Barbara Leach, who was a Bradford University student. Her body was dumped under a pile of bricks behind a building close to the university and close to her lodgings. It was his 16th attack. The murder of a woman who was not a sex worker again alarmed the public. And there was sort of a public outcry to find this weird side uh, ripper, which again was from the uh, hoax tapes that were sent in. Um, despite the false lead, Sutcliffe was interviewed again um, on two other occasions in 1979. And despite matching several forensic clues, as well as being on the list of 300 names in connection with the $5 note, he was not strongly suspected. In April of 1980, Sutcliffe was arrested for drinking and driving. While he awaited trial, he killed two more women. He murdered 47-year-old Marguerite Walls, 
on the night of August 20th and 20-year-old Jacqueline Hill, who was a student at Leeds University, on the night of November 17th. That year, he also attacked three other women that survived. Ufadia Bandera in Leeds on the 24th of September. Maureen Lee, who was an art student, attacked on the grounds of Leeds University on the 25th of October. And 16-year-old Teresa Sykes, who was attacked on the night of the 5th of November. On the 25th of November, Trevor Birdsall, who was the driver of the car at the initial attack of the very first sex worker, um, reported Sutcliffe to the police as a suspect, but the information vanished in the paperwork. On January 2nd of 1981, Sutcliffe was stopped by the police with a 24-year-old prostitute, Olivia Reavers, in his car. Now, uh, police checked his plates and noted that he had false numbers on his plates, and Sutcliffe was arrested and transferred to Dewsbury Police Station. There, he was questioned again in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper, as he matched many of the known physical characteristics. The next day, police went back to the uh, location where he had been arrested from and discovered a knife, hammer, and a rope that he had discarded when he told the police that he had to go to the restroom. He had also hid a second knife in the toilet at the police station when he was again permitted to use the bathroom. The police obtained a search warrant for his home and brought his wife in for questioning. When police stripped him down at the police station, he was wearing an upside down V-neck sweater, meaning that his legs were through the arms of the sweater and the V-neck exposing his genital area. The front of the elbows were padded to protect his knees, presumably because he knelt over his victim's corpses. After two days of questioning, on January 4th, Sutcliffe finally declared that yes, he was the Ripper. Over the next day, he calmly described all of the attacks, and weeks later, he claimed that God had told him to murder the women. He displayed emotion only when talking of his youngest victim, Jane McDonald, but when questioned about the murder of Joan Harrison, which was what the hoax tape had claimed, was a victim of the Ripper and was not, he vehemently um, denied any responsibility. Um, also, later down the road in 2011, DNA evidence found the murder of Joan Harrison, and it was by a convicted sex offender by the name of Christopher Smith, who had died in 2008. Sutcliffe was charged on the 5th of January, and at his trial, he pleaded not guilty to the 13 charges of murder, but guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The basis of his defense was that he claimed to be a tool of God's will. Sutcliffe claimed that he heard voices that told him to kill the prostitutes while working as a grave digger. He said that the voices originated from the headstone of a Polish man and that the voices were that of God. He did plead guilty to seven accounts of attempted murder, and the prosecution was originally going to accept his pleas um, after four psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, but the trial judge demanded an unusually detailed explanation of the prosecution reasoning. After a two-hour representation um, by the Attorney General, a 90-minute lunch break, and another 40 minutes of legal discussion, the judge rejected the diminished responsibility plea and the expert testimonies of the four psychiatrists, insisting that the case should be dealt with by a jury. The trial was set to commence on the 5th of May at, in 1981. The trial lasted two weeks, and despite the efforts of his counsel, Sutcliffe was found guilty of murder on all accounts and was sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. The jury rejected the evidence of the four psychiatrists because a prison officer had supposedly overheard Sutcliffe telling his wife that if he convinced people he was mad, then he might just get 10 years in a loony bin. The trial judge said that Sutcliffe was beyond redemption and hoped that Sutcliffe would never leave prison. He recommended a minimum term of 30 years to be served before parole could ever be considered, um, which would place him up for parole around 2011. However, on July 16th of 2010, the High Court issued Sutcliffe <clears throat> with a whole life tariff, meaning he is unlikely to ever be released. Sutcliffe is also one of very few inmates who have been issued this whole life tariff. 
After his trial, he did admit to two other attacks. However, it was decided that prosecution for these offenses was not in the public interest as the victims wished to remain anonymous. Sutcliffe's wife um, obtained a separation from him in 1982 and a divorce in April of 1994. And Sutcliffe has had issues with many different inmates um, attacking him due to the veracity of his crimes. And Ian K attacked him with a pen on March 10th of 1997. In this attack, Sutcliffe lost the vision in his left eye and his right eye was severely damaged. On December 22nd of 2007, Sutcliffe was attacked by a fellow inmate, Patrick Serrata, who lunged at him with a metal cutlery knife, shouting, you fucking raping, murdering bastard, I'll blind your fucking other one. Sutcliffe flung himself backwards and the blade missed his eye, but stabbed him in the cheek. So that's all I have on the Yorkshire Ripper. Thank you again for the request. Um, this again was a very interesting case, very a roller coaster of um, just horrific incidents, but was very interesting to learn about. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button below. If you guys have any suggestions for videos, true crime or otherwise, um, please leave those in the comments below. If you'd like to see more, please hit the subscribe button. I upload new videos every Wednesday. And other than that, I will see you guys next week. Bye.